the colours itself are about £300 per cow and you then have an annual fee, fee of about £50 paying for the, the upkeep of the programme and uh, uh, the package that you buy from No Fence uh, is an annual fee of £50. And what you get from that, you get an app on the phone and a user manual. Um, I'll, I'll just go into a bit more detail about the app on the phone. So, so this is screenshots off my phone. You open up the app and you get this first picture on the left, uh, which is a, the current status of your site. And all the little white circles are your, your colours on your cows. And the green areas are going to, to red and orange are the, the heat map of where they've been that day. So it's really good. Um, you get bleeps on your phone if a cow goes near to the to the virtual fence that you put around it. So I should just say, around the edge of that, the, the line you can see is a virtual fence that I've created uh, on this app. Um, it takes literally a minute to, to create a new one. It's so quick and easy to do. Uh, you then introduce your cows into that area. Um, and like I say, that's the status of of uh, one of my sites west of Airfield of the cows last week I think. Um, when you get the colours initially the cows need to be trained up how to use them so you, you put them into a fenced area, you create a, a virtual fence across one corner say and you let them get used to meeting that, that virtual fence. When they meet the virtual set fence they get an audible signal for a start so that the, the, the collar stops bleeping at them that bleeping gets louder and louder and louder and if they progress and trap go through that they, they get a pulse, an electric pulse from the collars. So over a period of two to three weeks of training in, in the training area they then learn to respond to the audible signal before the pulse and, and turn away from a, a virtual barrier, a virtual fence. Uh, so yeah, so once you've had the training they then go out into a, you create a pasture uh, put them out, out into there and off they go grazing. Um, you've got taps along the bottom of the of the phone app. The next one is the pastures and those are some of the pastures we've created for this area, we've created a training area. You can move them from one to another within minutes. It's so easy and flexible uh, and good to use. It's, it's a fantastic system. The third tab is the collars that gives you update on the battery pack. Um, we had on this site we, we grazed it last winter for the first time, I haven't been grazed to anyone's knowledge in over 30 years. We've got the cattle on there, uh, 16 cattle <coughs> last winter and the packs went all the way through the winter without needing to be recharged. Uh, just a good sunny day in winter, a day like today and uh, it's fabulous, it boosts the, the battery pack up. So, so the third tab is the state of the colours, uh, the fourth tab is moving the cows, just, you know, you go into that one to move them, it's simple, you just, you just click on a cow and then assign it to a new pasture, it switches the colours off, you move them to a new pasture and then they reactivate when they go back into there. Uh, as well as that, you can do analysis from, uh, from the, the phone app, uh, you, can, you can look at heat maps of where they've been today, yesterday or last week, uh, it will give you any audible signals or pulses from today, yesterday, last week. So you can, you know, there's quite a bit of analysis you can do from the, the software from it. Uh, it's a great system, found it re even for a bit of a technophobe like myself, it's been an easy system to use. Uh, because I'm working with partners, I've got uh, the Grazier using the same system, and uh, on this site it's, a, it's an NNR, so we've got the NNR staff as well. So if a cow does, Escape, we get immediate notification and we're all three of us are notified and we can we can you go on that the status bar and it tell you where that cow is. So you can go and find it and it, it'll highlight the position of it. So we're using no offence on a few sites where we couldn't raise before, but before we do that we do people engagement work. I'm looking at Cumbria, I've got some great a couple of great people engagement uh, officers and before we put cows onto an area, we meet the public, we do guided walks, and we meet the cows, things like that, just to ease the transition into grazing on an area that's not been grazed before. It's worked really well, signage up, put signage up for a few weeks before, um, 
I'd say last, last year we, we grazed west of Airfield, never been grazed before, we didn't have any problems at all. <coughs> this winter we've had a couple of occasions where the cows have bolted, and it's because uh, people with dogs out of control have spooked the herd and, and pushed them through the fence, uh, the invisible fence, if you will. Uh, they don't get a shot when they're not on the other side, they can come back on of their own accord, uh, or if they all choose to stay out, you've got to go back and, and retrieve them. So, what, what benefits have we seen? We've only been using the system for a couple of years, but uh, the middle slide again is west of Airfield, where it had no grazing, just cows being on there, they break up new pathways, there's lots of very rank grass on there. It's well used by dog walkers. There are a lot of um, paths that they use, and the only floristic diversity we had previously was at the edge of these paths where they were trampled. Since the cows were on there last winter, this spring, this picture at the left shows you that that floristic diversity is now spread across much bigger areas. So within within the first winter of using, and we're noticing big differences on this side. Um, you need to make sure that the cattle always have access to water and things, so on some sites that might, might mean bringing a bowser in. Uh, on this side, in winter, there's lots of natural water and cold storm anyway, so it's not a problem. Another benefit we've noticed, uh, we've turf strips some areas on, on the, the adjacent side, uh, North Walney, and the cattle won't touch the mature marrow, but the regeneration, little bits of marrow we've got coming up in the turf strip areas, the cattle are now grazing those, the new marrow, so that's a benefit that I hadn't foreseen, but it, it's something we've, we've found that's happened uh, since, since we grazed this area that couldn't be grazed before. Uh, so, what's been achieved? Uh, we're grazing three sites that we never grazed before. And the one on the left, North Walmer, Big Peninsula, end of an island, opposite Barring Furnace. It was just too complicated, too expensive to, to fence it really in the past. It hadn't been considered. A little bits of it were grazed further south, but really just <coughs> small bits that were fenced off. So we're now grazing a full 130 hectares where we weren't able to before. West of Airfield on the other side is just south of this. Again, an area that nobody could remember being grazed in over 30 years. We're grazing that. Um, and we've got other sites. The, the Belt of Galloway is in this middle picture. They're up on the Solway, uh, Morgan Banks at Silleth, uh, in an area. And as a legacy of the project, I'm hoping that this, the, this um, group of cows will be, be able to graze other sites on the Solway. There's lots of sand dune sites on the Solway that the AOMB manage our partners, um, and it'd be good for the cattle to then be used as a conservation grazing herd that can that can graze those sites. So been really successful. I would recommend anyone who's not tried it or, or not using it to use it. It's um, it's a fabulous system. Uh, there are obviously the problems, you know, uh, but uh, on the whole, very successful. I'd say West of Airfield, we initially had project plans to fence all of that, but that was going to be virtually £30,000. We haven't had to spend that £30,000 on it. We've put the, the cows on from, from nearby, uh, North Walmer, and it's worked really well. So, and plus a physical fence, it's there. The posts don't last that long these days. Uh, you can't move it. You put it in and that's it. That's, that's all you've got with this system. I can create a new pasture within a few minutes and we can have them grazing somewhere else if we need to. So, <coughs> on the whole, mainly positive uh, and a very good system. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jules Creer. I am a lead specialist advisor for coastal habitats and I work for Natural Resources Wales. And I'm here to talk about box switch and the rabbit grazing that we did as part of the project. Um, and just to kind of firstly start off with mm -hmm. the reasons why we would want to have rabbit grazing on our sites. Um, when we put the project together back in the day, and Ben alluded to it earlier on, it was quite some years ago, and we came up with this crazy idea that it would be great to bolster the 
rabbit populations on sand dunes um, because they are such amazing grazers. They, they don't need water, they don't need food, um, everything's there for them, they burrow into the sand dunes. They're, they are the best sand dune engineers that we've got. So we really wanted to see if we could harness their power and get them back into a, a state where they could do the work for us at Oxford. So there are keystone species on our sand dunes. Um, they, they graze so incredibly well. They, they graze the um, herbaceous species, they get it short, and then all of the beautiful flowers come through. They provide those lovely seed beds so that the, the seeds can germinate, the, 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 the heat comes in, and it's, it's just fantastic. But the problem we've got on our dunes is the rabbit populations have crashed, and that they've crashed because of um, myxomatosis, which was brought in in the 1950s, and more latterly, we've got rabbit hemorrhagic disease, there's two types, so that's causing problems on our sand dunes as well. So we're losing all these wonderful, lichen-rich, herb-rich, short turf grasslands. Um, so that's the benefits of rabbit grazing. Um, and they are becoming a rare sight on some of our sand dunes. We just don't see them as much as we used to. Um, and that is because of the, the disease issue. Um, we also have um, a lack of large grazing animals. So as Richard was saying, some of our sites haven't been grazed for 30 odd years because it's just too difficult. So if you haven't got the large animals coming in and grazing the, the, the vegetation down, then the rabbits, they don't like it. They don't like long turf. I don't you know why, maybe it pokes in their eyes, but they like it really, really short. So if you don't have that, then the, the rabbits disappear. So all of that in together means you end up with a tall, rank sword, um, and then you lose all that wonderful biodiversity. So it's finding the right balance. So if you've got too many rabbits, and this has happened in Australia where the rabbits were brought in, they can absolutely decimate an area when they have everything they need and they do what rabbits do best and they proliferate and they get going, they can strip an area right down to absolute bare sand, uh, bare earth, whatever it is, and then you, you flip to the, the wrong side of the balance. Where the rabbit population is very low, you're up on the other side of the balance and you've got a lot of sword and you, you've lost all your biodiversity. So it's, it's finding that sweet spot in the middle where you've got a rabbit population which is self-sustaining, giving you all those wonderful biodiversity benefits um, but you, you're, you're not tipping either way. So in our minds, we thought, how can we, how can we achieve this? What is the best way to do it? So we came up with plan A, which was supplementation. We thought, right, okay, there are places where there are hundreds of rabbits and they're causing problems. And we knew that flat home out in the, I want to say Bristol Channel, um, which is owned bizarrely, I think, by Cardiff Council, um, has, huge amounts of rabbits and they cull them and, and deal with them and we thought great let's grab some rabbits off flat home and take them over to Oxwich and we can pop them on Oxwich um, have a supplementation uh, program we can do soft release we'll inoculate them <coughs> against Mixie and RHD they won't pass that on to their young but it will give them a degree of immunity so that they can get their population going and we can do all of that and the rabbits on flat home are, are particularly cute as well. I don't know why, but they are absolutely gorgeous with the little white patches on them. Um, so that was the idea. And then we hit bureaucracy and paperwork and problems internally. And it just became such an absolute utter nightmare to get rabbits, which exist on the site, bringing more in. Um, we had problems because if they're a pest, we can't do it. Um, the paperwork for transporting animals off an island onto the mainland was going to cause problems. So we just decided that it was probably more hassle than it was worth. So what could we do if we were going to bring more rabbits in? So we came up with Plan B, and this is where my sidekick, Nick Edwards, will come in and explain to you what we did at Oxwich so that we could actually bolster the rabbit population without bringing new rabbits in. Thank you. Hiya. 
Nick, um, Nick Edwards. I know a lot of you came down Oxwich uh, last year to look at um, what we did and what you did. Um, so that was nice. Yeah, plan A uh, didn't work. Balaclavas went away. Well, Hesse and Sachs went back in the cupboards. <laughs> we realised we couldn't meet on the M4 in a shady spot to transport our bits. I was told not for the first time I was an idiot. So we went to plan B. Plan B, um, we've got the area you can see, you can see the scrape we did in the middle. And around that area, um, we had most of the warrants. Um, so we brought in a local uh, contractor, conservation ecologist, and they gave us an idea of what we already knew, really, was the, the hub of where the rabbit populations were. And with that then, the areas around it is where we had the most of the scrub um, and the slacks. So we set up out on a plan of um, getting the areas down to uh, as short a sward as we could. So the, the slats that you can see, the one that we scraped, it's all the north side of the water is where the burrows were. And then at the back of that then is where we had most of the, um, had most of the slats with, with um, uh, the trees in and the scrub. So we set about with a plan to um, bring in a mower, like a, a robot cut and a tractor. And we mowed it right down to as close as we can get, almost scarifying it. And then in the area where we had larger scrub, um, we sort of got rid of it and started to lay it out into habitat piles. And I've been doing this 20 odd years and I started habitat piles with a thing, we had habitat piles everywhere. And then it was ch chip in, get the chip off, which, which isn't really, um, you know, the, the best kind of sustainable method. And then we went to a kind of uh, treat standing dead, treat standing dead. So we didn't have a lot of habitat piles. The only grazing we've got in Oxford is our horses. Um, we would like to have sheep, we'd like to have cattle, um, but we've got too much of a pressure from a half a million people we get a year, um, and a huge amount of dog walkers. Uh, so we struggle, plus it's a very small site. So with that in mind, we have to turn to a different kind of method, and, and the method was if we can't have sheep, we can't have cattle, we've got the horses, and we've got to encourage the, the, the rabbit populations. So what we started doing was the mowing, and then in the slacks, we started doing even the kind of twigs and the, and the, and the lower stuff you'd normally lose um, in the chipper or even gathered or left alone. We started making piles, so we went from smaller piles to bigger piles and um, laid them all around the, the edge of the slack there. And from the edge of the slack, then out to the other slacks um, to create corridors. Now, initially, um, we started <coughs> around the areas um, behind the slack, we started to find a lot more rapid activity. Um, so close by where the, the main uh, scrub was taken away and where we had the main um, areas of, of, of vegetation piles and uh, what we saw was, mm -hmm. you can't see it, yeah I can see it, you can see it. What we had was the piles and then bare sand patches and then rabbit poo and these were popping up more often than not. And what we did is we went round and had a look. And basically, everywhere we laid scrub, we were finding little patches of grass and little bits of poop. So, um, um, obviously, for that, for us, that's a success story. Um, for us, going onwards now is to monitor it um, and to see what happens now in the summer and then change our management technique a bit. We can't have habitat piles everywhere because we're just going to, you know, inundate the place, but try and network it a bit and then create more corridors. So, Thank you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and the pony's got a little bit of on its head. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Uh, first thing to say is I'm not Nick Marriott. So, um, uh, Callum Devley from Cornwall, Nick, my colleague who is the site manager for the site I'm going to talk about. Um, unfortunately, he's got a virus that hasn't, hasn't made it today, so I'm going to do his talk for him. I have kind of got it here, I'll try not... Actually, Nick, he, he writes very good talks, and he tends to use his talks and his presentations as, almost as a means of therapy. He kind of unburdens himself. Um, so I'm going to stick very much uh, to Nick's talk. 
and be true to that. Um, so here we are. Um, we have got what Nick considered to be an ungraceable site. So Upton Towns, and this was a, a sand dune site that Andy Nelson talked about earlier. It's the one um, with uh, a lot of population around it, a lot of um, urban settlements, holiday parks, um, and, and we considered it to be an ungraceable site. Um, Upton Towns is part of a wider sand dune system called Hale Towns. So the bigger view you can see there on the right is the whole sand dune system, which is um, about yeah, 400 hectares. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful site, um, for, you know, it's uh, within St Ives Bay. Very, 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 very popular. Um, so, now this, this is Nick speaking, tatty and unloved. So not one of his favourite nature reserves. So the first impressions of um, Upton Towers will be tatty, neglected, heavily dog walks, dog mess, anti-social anti behaviour, more a country park uh, than a nature reserve. Um, dog walkers and other visitors were using the site for decades um, and certain patterns of behaviour have become established um, so we were concerned about making changes to the site. Um, another thing for, for Nick is that he manages 20 reserves in West Cornwall so Upton Towns is just one of his nature reserves. Um, so Nick felt he couldn't give it the time that it deserved um, and this is very Nick. Nick said, as a lone male without a dog he often felt like a trespasser and started carrying a clip frame just to show he was on official business and belonged on site. Very, uh, it's just setting the scene here. Um, so yeah, Upton Towns at that time, before Dynamic Dunes, we considered it to be ungraceable. Um, as a triple SI, it was failing. Um, and uh, also Upton Towns is just one of a number of sites. So the picture there in the right, uh, on your screen shows Upton Towers, one of seven or eight different sites owned by different landowners um, that we try to manage as a whole, but um, that, those issues of multiple ownership um, can sometimes uh, uh, prove difficult in those situations. Um, so as well as Upton Towers, we had designs on trying to get grazing on a number of these sites, um, but we also consider those similar to, to, to Upton Towers in terms of being ungrazable. Um, so in terms of the, the failing triple SI, too much scrub, about 25% across the site, too many invasives and not enough bare sand. So very familiar uh, issues to all of us in the room here. Um, Cornwall Wildlife Trust actually and Nick got a lot of experience of grazing nature reserves uh, elsewhere in Cornwall. Um, but we were very worried about putting, um, putting animals out into Upton Towns. Uh, Nick, Nick doesn't really go into it in much detail here, but I... My, my impression, knowing the site myself, I just felt um, we would put up electric fencing, that was really our only option in mean, such an open landscape. This is before um, uh, no fence collars. Um, but um, yes, put out electric fencing and the next day would come and it would be removed for us. So it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a real concern um, and we were worried that the locals wouldn't be happy with it. It's very heavily dog walked. Um, so the way we were managing the site back then um, was um, a, lot of, a lot of cutting of scrub um, and then spraying. So we would cut the scrub and then you'd get the, the aftergrowth and then we'd go in and spray that. Uh, I remember we had one particular unfortunate incident where we would use a dye to, um, to, let, to show ourselves where we sprayed and a heavily walked dog site. Um, someone suddenly appeared with a blue dog, um, <laughs> compla complaining to our staff as to why is my dog blue, and they got very upset when they realised that uh, we were spraying, we were using glyphosate, so again, familiar issues to, to, to site managers in the room. Um, so we then found that we were having to uh, electric fence the, uh, the areas that we'd sprayed to try and help to keep the dogs out, uh, put signs on the electric fencing, so all of this was becoming very labour intensive, um, very expensive. Um, and um, yeah, it was just, just making more and more work for ourselves. Um, and we were getting uh, negative comments as well. Um, people were sort of complaining and saying, what about the birds? Why are you cutting scrub? What about the birds? Um, I can't believe the Wildlife Trust are using herbicide. Um, the site is already good for wildlife. Um, if it ain't broke, why are you trying to fix it? Um, the work sites themselves, um, at certain times of the year would look very sort of lifeless, 
Um, after we cut scrub quite often you'll get certain plants come back like ragwort and mustard and thistles um, and so it's quite hard to sell the work that we were trying to do, we were trying to be positive and say we're doing this for the benefit of wildlife. Um, in terms of our engagement at the time um, we were struggling and uh, Nick has put in bold here, was all this work really for nothing? Um, but. So this is where we go from being a little bit negative to a bit more positive here. So dynamic genescape saved the day. So thankfully, uh, for Nick's benefit, um, uh, that in the 19, uh, 2019, 2020, um, the ungrazable was grazed. Um, so our site, along with three others in, the, in that year, were all grazed. Um, and this actually led, so all of a sudden, what was a, what was a negative suddenly turned into a real positive. Um, and so Nick was starting to actually get positive interactions on the, uh, on the sand dune site. So I think the important thing is, why did it change? Um, uh, you know, we didn't believe that we could do it, so what was the difference um, and why were we, were we able to graze huts and towers? Um, and it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward, and maybe some of you would say, well, you know, you should have, you should have realised this all along, but, I mean, the, the essential ingredients were firstly a grazier, and you've got uh, Gerald, our grazier there, eating a Cornish pasty, um, and, uh, you know, he's a, 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 classic, a classic Cornish um, farmer, um, but without people like Gerald who are willing to take on sites like this, and this is grazing with ponies, not, not with cattle, um, you know, we wouldn't have got anywhere. Um, looking after the ponies ourselves is just, is just a step too far. So having somebody who's willing to do it is a, is a vital step. Um, so Gerald has been uh, absolutely priceless. Um, we also have the other chap with a cap on there is um, Martin Rule, um, who is, um, he manages and looks after a group called the Friends of the Towns, the Friends of Upton Towns. Um, and as part of the Dynamic Dunescape project, uh, Martin was awarded a contract to start doing work on site with volunteers. Um, so Martin did various jobs, scrub clearance. Um, so people, dog walkers who regularly use the site got familiar to, to seeing Martin. And Martin was there helping to set up those original fencing enclosures, talk to local people, so starting to reassure them um, that the fact that we're putting an electric fence here doesn't mean you're going to have to stop walking your dog on the dunes. Um, and, and starting to turn it around into a positive thing. And then finally, we recruited people from the local community to actually become our volunteer wildlife, what we call lookers, or lookerers. Um, so local people actually helping us to go and check, uh, do the, uh, the welfare checks of the livestock. Um, so that helped to start turning into a positive as well. So as I say, for Nick, it went from, the site manager went from complaints to compliments. Um, so we were starting to get, well, firstly, the actual impact on the habitat was starting to be very positive. So those areas that were where we were originally clearing scrub, and then there was a lot of, um, uh, we were using the, the, the pe uh, pesticide, um, and then in, you know, the, the plants that were coming through um, just looked like more scrubs in some people's eyes. With the grazing, we were starting to get the type of sand dune sward, the grassland sward that we wanted, and you were starting to get pyramidal orchids and plants that we would, would expect to see, and people were starting to see a difference and understand what we were doing. Um, people apparently were travelling to the towns to meet the ponies. Um, one lovely story is that on one of our sites, the residents of a nursing home could see the ponies from their windows um, and, um, and were very, you know, reported back to us that they were very happy about that. Gerald Argrazia um, regularly brings a patient. Um, she's the only person allowed to feed the ponies. Uh, every Sunday he brings her um, from the acute psychiatric admissions unit uh, he calls it pony therapy. Um, and yet some of the people who were anti-grazing to start with um, are actually now uh, part of their solution and they've joined our lookers groups. So the future, just to finish with for Upton Towns, um, is how, we, how are we going to continue and maintain this grazing? I mean, from a man site management point of view, um, high level stewardship, uh, the high tier countryside stewardship um, will be the vehicle which we'll use to, to support our grazing. Um, we will, uh, Martin, uh, Rule and Gerald um, will work with Natural England and use the higher tier educational access so they'll continue to do the educational work, um, to promoting to local people um, what are the importance of grazing. Um, the site itself is looking very likely to be designated as a national nature reserve so that's another positive thing from a public engagement point of view. Um, and finally, yeah, the, so the right hand map 
on your screen with the little um, I, uh, dots on it. So at the start of the Dynamic Dunes project, um, there were eight sites, uh, none of them were grazed. And now, as we come close to finishing the Dynamic Dunes project, Dynamic Dunes Great Projects, seven um, are being grazed or have been grazed. So um, it's a, yeah, a really positive thing. A happy end to what started off as a bit of a miserable story. Thank you. And um, so, going back down to Dorset, Sutherland Bay, we also had uh, the reintroduction of Red Devon Castle and also used virtual fencing to keep them in place. And community engagement here played a real critical and important role to the success of this reintroduction of grazing. So, I thought I'd start off with what is community engagement? Because, as Callum and Nick have just kind of shared, community engagement is not just putting a poster up. Or it's not just putting, doing a one-off event and hoping that everyone is going to attend and then everyone's going to be happy and supportive. Community engagement takes time and it takes resource. It's, it's hard work. But it's definitely worth it for conservation projects and for the work that we're trying to do. So, in, um, in Dorset, in Perfect, where I work, we have a whole engagement team that works there. And we actually look at these five ways of well-being when we're thinking about how you, how you do community engagement. So these five ways are actually, it's, a, it's actually about mental health well-being. But we find they really apply very well to community engagement work as well. So if we go through them, connect. So the first thing you want to do is connect with your community, whether it's a group, whether it's a school, an institution, whatever it is. And when you're connecting, you're putting your agenda aside. This isn't a tick box exercise, this is really understanding that community, what their needs are, and learning from them. The second one is be active. So we want to get our hands mucky. We don't want to just be present bystanders, you know, just going in for the nice, fun, shiny bits. We want to be part of the community, we want to get mucky with them and actually be part of what they're wanting to achieve. Take notice and keep learning, I'm just going to kind of merge those ones together, which is really, really understanding your community. So being empathetic to them, learning what their, what their problems are, what their ideas are, what their aspirations for the local area are. And finally, give. So give is about giving your time, giving your presence, and actually being able to collaborate and share power with the community members. So you want to be generous, because actually we're not just there to take from the community at all, we're there to be there with the community and to actually work together. Just as much as the community is part of our organisations, we're also part of them. So as an example of how that's kind of worked, um, I just wanted to share with you the Planet Perbeck community group. So Planet Perbeck is a local environmental group that came together during lockdown. And they came together to fight the ecological and climate emergency on a very local scale. So what did we do? Well, the first one, connect. So we connected on their terms. It was lockdown and everything was virtually. So we would go to their virtual meetings, we would be there and we would just listen and we would help as and when it was needed. The second one, be active. So we were actual coordinators with the Planet Perbet group. Although we were wearing our National Trust or Dynamic Geoscapes hat, we were also wearing a Planet Perbet hat. We were part of that community group and we worked alongside them to help achieve their needs. The next one, notice and learn. We wanted to understand what it is that they actually want to achieve. What does the Planet Perfect community want to do? Actually, they just wanted to do something good. They wanted action. And what better action, really, than what the Dynamic Dunescapes project provides through volunteer work? And the last one, give. So I think give was almost the biggest thing that we did with Planet Perfect. We invested a lot of time going into these meetings, but also actually helping them with their work. 
So providing strategic help of how to build as a community group to actually being one of the kind of um, coordinators for their, for their festival and for events. And this was definitely not wasted because this picture here shows um, the festival that they did just after lockdown, which is the local community festival, all about sharing the great environmental work that happens in Perlow. And Dynamic Dunescapes played a real, real heavy part in that festival because they wanted it to. Not because we asked them to, but because through this relationship they knew what we were doing and they wanted to shout out about it. So they put on events for, uh, in the dunes to do volunteer events. And when we also had um, big presentations in the MOLA, which is this like local community centre, there were also presentations and lots of talks done about Dunescapes and about things like the grazing that was to come. So, how does this kind of all go back to grazing? Well, when we wanted to reintroduce the cattle to the dunes, we were pretty nervous, to be honest. There was, there was a lot of fear that there was going to be a lot of backlash um, and there was going to be a real negative community response. So, we wanted to be very, very proactive in this to make sure that this wasn't going to happen, to bring the local community on the journey with us rather than just kind of give them a big surprise by the end of it. And really, the, the work of this kind of Arty Cow project, it's not just the Arty Cow project in itself, it really is the work of building those local community connections years before the Dynamic Dunes Gates project actually came about to have that real good foundation so that when we wanted to introduce something like this, the foundations were set and it was really easy to connect with those community groups. So really the Arty Cow project was an opportunity to do something really good with the local community that we already had those really great connections with and to build on that community engagement. And to also do it with a lead of children and young people. So pretty simple, we worked with the local schools and local youth groups and the local universities. We went over and we told them about this project, about why the cows are important, and we gave them a large cutout of a cow and some paints, and we asked for their help. We asked them to figure out what message they want to do, figure out what kind of drawing, what kind of paint they wanted to do, and to do this on their cow, which was then going to be put out on the dunes as a way to communicate with the public. And at the end of the day, these local kids you know, we were working with local kids that had, many of them had never even been to Southern Bay, even though it's about a 10 minute drive or something for them. And I feel like that's fundamental because actually it's their landscape, these sand dunes are their landscape. And actually by them being able to be part of that and paint something that was then put on their landscape, they then bring their families, they bring their friends, and they actually feel like it is their landscape, not that we're just telling them it is. So it was really built on those foundations that we have with the five ways of well-being that actually led to us to be able to do that. And then on top of that, to be able to kind of build even more with those local community groups. And I think because of that community engagement, in terms of the communications, it was also very easy to come back to work. So we weren't having to do a whole load of communications ourselves. We had a lot of, we had our press releases, we had everything in order. Actually, what we found was the best for communications was when other people shouted about the work that we did. So, featuring in the social, in people's social media, in school newsletters, local newsletters, the local news outlets as well, online, Facebook, all of these different things. The local community are far better actually at sharing our message than we are, and it gets far, far wider than that as well. So actually, from something that we were really nervous about at the beginning, that we were going to have loads of negative responses and comments, we didn't get a single one, which is pretty amazing, really. The cows came, and everybody loved them, actually. There was just a huge positive response. Everyone was really intrigued as well about the virtual fencing, about these no-fence collars, how they worked. All the kind of fear of whether you know there'd be like this ethical arguments because we've been really really proactive in that and because we were present in the community and because these were conversations that were happening way before the cows arrived, it was all received with open arms. So the legacy of Arty Cows. Um, Arty Cows was actually used again in another site in Perbeck, the National Trust, to again share positive 
um, positive stories about conservation grazing. And we also then replicated it twice more with two other conservation projects in the area. So first was when we um, put up um, a, way, a way defence at Sutherland Bay to, so that dogs can get inside to try and create a safe space for birds to be able to recolonise and breed there. And but very recently, because they're actually out right now, are also the arty dogs, which we have out on the east to encourage good dog behaviour, dogs on leads during the bird nesting season. But really, for me, the legacy of this project isn't in more arty animals. I'm intrigued to see what's the next arty animal that we're going to create. But the legacy isn't in that. The legacy is in the community engagement. So I feel like what Dynamic Dunescapes did is it provided a huge amount of capacity, resource, and also really fun opportunities for the community to be involved, which actually just added on to something that is already continuing and will continue to, to happen as well. So it isn't something that's going to end when Genescapes end, or, nor was it something that began when Genescapes began, but actually it's something which has, Genescapes has led to being stronger and more embedded within the National Trust team and the conservation <coughs> organisations across Perfect really. And actually what we have got now, which is for me, the best legacy of dynamic genescapes in the area is that because of the real great work we've done with children and young people at Sutherland Bay, we're now going to be a children and young people hub for the National Trust across different properties. So we've got three different properties of the National Trust which are going to be merging together to be a children and young people hub, which essentially means more capacity, more resource, more focus into children and young people engagement. But it also is an opportunity to engage with our, with our kind of urban uh, local children and young people as well. Because this was perfect local, we also have Bournemouth, Christchurch and Pool, BCP, which is our uh, urban area next door to the Sand Dune site. And it's an opportunity to be able to get tons of kids and young people who will never have been to those areas out into Sand Dunes and being able to feel like it's actually a place that is just as much theirs. That is it from me. Thank you very much. And oh, we are now going to do our Q and A. So just give us a few moments as we rejig, and then we can start Q and A. So, uh, the first question from the online people is: uh, Grazing new marram grass. I can see the benefit, how it benefits the cows, but how does it help the dunes? Me. Um, these were areas of Victoria Street uh, previous, previous to the cattle going on, and I was, to be honest, I was a little disappointed about how quickly the marron grass came back. Um, but by putting the cows on there, on this area, have not been grazed before, with the no fence collars that enabled us to, to get them on there. I was really pleased to see, see that they, they nibbled the, the marron, the new growth marron down, whereas the they would just leave the mature marron grass and wouldn't graze it. Um, so the benefits on that are they're keeping these turf stripped areas open and the sand moving for longer uh, because as soon as that vegetates over again um, you're losing that sand movement. It uh, keeps it open, you get your pioneer species more able to move in if that stays open for longer. And um, linking into the rabbit grazing we found that the rabbits absolutely love the turf sit areas. Within 24 hours of the machines exposing area of bare sand, rabbits were on there digging and eating the marron roots. Uh, so the longer that you can keep those areas open, the better, the better it. Okay, and then the second question from the online audience is, Ragwort is great for cinnabar moths, but how does it fit with grazing ponies? Uh, so uh, we have ragwort on, um, on the towns I've just talked about, and um, ponies. We would not electric fence an enclosure with a lot of ragwort in it, um, because that would just be, you know, that that would be asking for trouble. And particularly if you were pushing the ponies really hard and they didn't have that much to eat. Um, but actually, if you've got an extensive area and you've got ponies and ragwort, so there's plenty for the ponies to eat. You shouldn't necessarily have a problem. So. So we, you know, we have ragwort, cinnabar moths, and ponies living happily at Upson Towns. 
listening. So, I've got a question for the off switch guys about the rabbits. And um, just wondering how you get a, a handle on the, the numbers when you have people doing like maybe the surveys or whether it's just a bit more sort of ad hoc and like how do you get a feel for are the numbers increasing or decreasing? Yeah, it was, it was a bit frustrating to be honest because when you go to ask the question um, about monitoring to external people like uh, consultancies, you, you give them the, um, the premise of, look, we've got some rabbits, we've got a few rabbits here, we've got some more rabbits over here, it's all ad hoc, which we've, you know, either, either by what we see or what we observe, observe, you know, observe on the field, or what people tell us. So when you get answers back of like, oh yeah, there's quite a few here, but there's more over here. And I was asking, well, do you have numbers? I mean, so the question was then asked about counting drop-ins and counting areas like that. So they came back with some more solid numbers. And the numbers sort of equated to small populations, so 20 and below in certain areas. Do you know what I mean? And then as it's expanded on, um, you know, you're talking, you know, handfuls of, you know, five or six, half a dozen uh, numbers. But it was, it was frustrating because obviously you want to know precise numbers, but I think unless you um, go out there and spend hours actually looking through, you know, a thermal scope or whatever, or go ramping, then, you know, I don't think you're going to see. It's just, for, for us going forward, it's seeing um, the impact um, immediately, whether they're coming on to the bare areas and the grazed areas, and just counting the, 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 the drop-ins and seeing, um, seeing how that goes, really. I'm Jade Vernon, uh, National Trust, Northern Ireland. Um, so we've been looking at graziers and using their own, um, the, <laughs> the collars for grazing basically, but we're having an issue in terms of whether graziers will actually want to do it. They're worried about the productivity, they're worried of their cattle in terms of having it on, as well as the kind of, you know, they're already sort of having to use a lower density in terms of the site. So I just wanted to ask, has there been any work done on that side of things, as well as that kind of consideration? And then the other side is also, um, in terms of the GPS fencing, um, in terms of that range, how accurate is that? Because we've got some quite sort of very specific sites in terms of that side of things. Uh, grazers initially were, were concerned, we were, we were initially concerned whether the, the cattle would be okay on the dunes. Uh, without supplementary feed. Um, we use traditional breeds, we've got Belter Galloways up on the Solway and um, crossbred traditional breeds uh, down at other sites and they've all been fine without supplementary feed. Belter Galloways are thriving, uh, doing re really well. So uh, the other point about how accurate is the, the no fence signal, um, you would always play safe. If, for instance, you had a road, one of your boundaries on your side, you wouldn't put the, uh, the no fence boundary right up to it, you'd, you'd be 20 metres back just to be safe. Uh, so I, I would say, uh, it is quite accurate when you go out and if, I had, if I'm making a new pasture, invisible boundary, I go and test it on the ground to, to make sure it's okay. It is quite accurate, but I would always allow an extra 10 metres at least, just to be on the safe side. And just, sorry, in terms of the collars, it was more of the stress side of things. They're worried about the animals because of the stress not being as productive in terms of the pulses. Um, the, all the, th the feedback from, from Scandinavia where they've used it say they get less pulses than they would on a traditional electric fence. On a traditional electric fence, they're quite often trying to lean over to graze on the outside and get it. With no fence, um, the, the theory is that they respond to the audible signal before the, the pulse. I think on the um, Dynamic Gene Sticks website, there is a sum I think we've got a summary um, report about the, um, by Sally, is that right? That gives a load of details about the, um, the grazing with the no fence collars and how that. Um, went to DEFRA, it was sort of a, a study just pulling the evidence together, so it might be worth having a look at that document. It's on the um, site manager's page. So. 
and I, I was saying it's the, the main stress that they suffer is from, from dogs, if, yeah. if they don't control dogs on there, which they would have got if we'd have fenced the area anyway. They've been more hemmed in, at least they, they've an escape route with, a, with no fence, they can go straight through and keep going, uh, which they wouldn't be able to do if the, the area was fenced. They should be getting uh, zapped with those collars on a regular basis. If they're getting zapped, it's not working. They should be trained um, so they're not getting stressed by the zap. So I'm just saying that you know, with those collars, it's not about them getting getting electric shocks on a regular basis. They should be trained so they're not getting those shocks. Um, so it shouldn't be a cause of stress. Um, obviously communicate that to the roses is it's a challenge, isn't it, to bring them on board. Yeah, uh, Kath Hewitt from Stands of Life. Um, I just wanted to sort of, uh, and it's not necessarily a question just for the panel, but maybe for everyone in general, because um, I think we need to, I'm really the biggest fan of grazing on the dunes, so don't get me wrong, but I think we need a reality check in that uh, the standard grazing has, has an impact on scrub, but it does not stop your scrub problem. And we have a lot of sites that have been grazed for a long time, and we still have a lot of scrub coming in on those sites. So I guess what I'd like to just ask the room is that has anybody explored other kinds of livestock uh, than, other than the usual ponies and cattle, um, and how they livestock that can actually interact more with the scrub um, and has anybody even thought about uh, going as far as uh, goats or pigs perhaps um, and you know really kind of stretch our vision in terms of types of livestock and how they're going to operate on a really large scale as we go forward into the future so I don't know if anyone's got anything to say about that We graze goats in our future years um, so we had um, the, the, the very problem of the slacks where we'd, um, we bought in goats and then put electric fence from the slack um, for them to eat um, with the young scrub and then move them on to another slack. Um, and we initially bought in goats from North Wales who just escaped. Um, and one of them, one of them lived for 14 years on the tour of the reserve then. You know, couldn't get, get him back. But um, we went to African pygmy goats because they were more manageable. Um, but the, the issue being was, well, what the problem we had was um, that they, they, would, they would check stuff and they'd go on to, um, you know, the larger the stuff, the, the wasn't less, was less palatable. So we're in a position where if, if you cut stuff and then bring them in after to, to, to eat it off was the, was the better solution. Mm -hmm. But by that stage, you're already cutting the scrub. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the use of herbicide or whatever then replaced the goats. Plus they're really difficult to manage, you know. So um, I think if you, I, if someone asked me the other day, they've got, a, they've got a small herd of goats and they're, they're thinking, you know, could we do stuff with them? And I, I think there is, there is room, there's certainly you know, a, a discussion to be had if you can pinpoint them into certain small areas and manage them. I think it's resource heavy, it is. Uh, Paul Brennan again from Liverpool University to, um, to follow Kath's um, comments and maybe pose questions to you and other people about grazing. Again, I'm a fan of grazing, actually, I owned some sheep at one point. Uh, the first sheep grazing on, in, on the second coast, and everyone told us that they'd end up on barbecues and cake, and they didn't. And now the site is extensively grazed, and even just uh, uh, picked me goats on all the sites in the past, uh, etc. Um, and though I'm a site manager, I'm just a rubbish academic. Um, but I, I want to just sort of comment to, to push this point on grazing that we kind of default that this is the answer. I just want to push it a bit further. It's brilliant to hear about this coltless um, grazing. <coughs> Some of those sites in Cumbria graze for hundreds of years. Sand scale horns, for instance, you know, hundreds of years of grazing on that site. Um, and, and they, those, if you look at the sort of records, the animals would have been shepherded or herded, taken out onto those sites, moved around, and you can see the possibilities for manipulating 
create some patterns in the way that that would have happened in the past. And then rabbits, just to note, you know, rabbits are noted as the top 100 invasive species by the IUCN. So, you know, and they're not native to Britain. Um, and yet, all the sites we've been talking about are triple SIs. And if you look at the selection criteria for biological triple SIs, I've got some quotes from down it. They're unmodified by human activity. Um, grazing for hundreds of years, rabbits all over them. Um, so, um, just to raise that question, right, there's a philosophical question there. But also, if we think about the notches beforehand, and this is where I'll get to the question and reinforce the point, is that if you look at a dune system, very simple and cautious, I'm sitting next to Ken here, and about to his expertise on uh, to debate some things. Because if you divide, you can simply divide a dune system, or do, Pat Dune does this between beaches and four dunes and the interaction, you see the interaction with notches there and then inland dunes. And one of the big things for inland dunes is grazing, conservation grazing. But I'll put to you, great, well done, I've owned sheep, I've counted rabbits, I've done all that. Can't we do better? Don't we need to think a bit more geomorphologically in those areas? Because grazing, as criticised by a lot of people, is, is, can be, can have a, possibly legitimate uh, criticism of being just dune gardening. <clears throat> I'll just get a coat. All I could add on, on that point is I have a site that I manage uh, Havery. Half the site is private land on a farmer, always been grazed. The other half is Millen Council, not been great for 30 odd years. Um, early on in the project, between lockdowns, we took seven hectares of gorse off the Millen Council part. Um, if we hadn't have done that, the whole site would have been, in another 30 years, definitely would have all been six foot high gorse. Um, so, yeah, to, to me, clearly, grazing is an important part of that. Uh, is managing the dune system. I don't think, um, I mean, you know our group chat, from, you, from um, you know, when we did the work with CH, and our group chat came to have a look at, I always remember this, in Whitford, and we've got the, the salt marsh lamb, which is, a, which is a, a business with lots of sheep, and the sheep coming off the sand dune, and just coming off the salt marsh, onto the sand dunes, and they were being hefted then onto the sand dunes. Um, and they were preferring the sand dunes to the salt marsh, and then obviously they were being put on in April, coming off in September. So they were devastated. Look at the flora and um, the biodiversity. And uh, we were looking to get rid of the sheep. And I remember walking along, and, and our group and said to me, he pointed to all the sheep that were on the salt marsh, and he said, "You want all them on your sand dune?" He said, "And you only take the sheep off when the sheep start eating the other sheep." <laughs> I mean, and that was his thing and, and because what he, what he said was the overgrazing is a lot better than any undergrazing I mean, and, and we see that with Whitford because um, we've, got, we've got very little scrub we've you know, we had um, ragwood for years and years because of that sheep trespass but now we're managing it we've gone back to manage it start to come back and you know we're, we're having to mechanically yeah, animal welfare issues yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. My name's Rini, um, and I've been grazing the Croy burrows over the hill from here. Um, obviously not with my own mouth, but with my own <laughs> dexters uh, that have very big horns to put off the uh, encroaching visitors and dogs. Uh, it was, we have a high level stewardship a long time ago now to maintain the grassland at the back of the dunes, and particularly the population of the stalked puffball which is pretty good there. Um, what worries me about you, no fence people, although I think it's brilliant technology, is that you never mention the water supply. Uh, I did mention water supply in my talk, yeah, it's something you need to bear in mind. I said that the site that we put the, the, the cays on there at West of Airfield has a lot of natural water supply during the winter. During the summer, it may be a case of bringing a bowser in. Yeah. Brad Bowers is in on some of our, our, on our sites as well, for, for the ponies, but also another site that we, um, 
raised with cattle uh, we need to bring bowsers on. Um, also talking about alternative um, animals for grazing, we have had a favourable assessment from an expert for that site to graze with bison, so that's um, something that uh, we're thinking about at some point in the future. Watch this place.